between those three different tests? Is that what you asked? Uh, yeah. Um, well, essentially it comes down to, uh, especially in the behavioral and financial control, um, whether or not the worker has autonomy to decide how to do the job, what tools to use, brings his own stuff, or it's provided or directed specifically by the employer or his staff of some sort. If it's provided by the employer, then he's more likely an employee. If it brings his own stuff, like a plumber or an electrician to do work in your home, says, I'm going to come fix it, but you don't tell him what to do because he knows what he's doing, then he's like an independent contractor. Exactly. That's perfect. Sheila? Any well, there's on? one other thing, and that is um, the amount of money that's being received. Uh, and an independent contractor, that that amount is pretty much determined by the independent contractor, not by the employer. Yes. Correct. Thank Correct. you. Under financial. Thank you. All right. All right. So those three tests are quite literally the determination tests for an independent contractor and an employee. Now, there are two more types. Okay. Let's take a look at these guys and see what they are. Statutory now, and non-statutory. Correct. Statutory is, is like an insurance agent. Okay. And Let's it's, a, it's uh, employee by statute is the reason why they call it statutory. Okay. Key number one, a statutory employee is issued a W-2. They actually are an employee of the company, but they're a special employee. Okay. They are issued an actual W-2. They don't get a 1099. But their income is not income that uh, is reported as like it's a regular uh, W-2 income. Yeah. It is reported on a Schedule C. But because they're an actual W-2 employee, they don't pay Social Security tax, uh, the self-employment uh, self tax. Okay. They have a W-2 but they don't pay the self-employment tax. Okay. And the biggest way your employer does, right? That's correct. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And they, the they biggest, get withholding also. They get withholding. Correct. They're getting a regular W-2 with all the withholding and everything on the W-2, but it has box 13 of the W-2 checked indicating that they're a statutory employee. All right, and who are these people? Insurance agents for one. There you go, full-time life insurance salespeople because they're selling a product, but they're not necessarily always on the clock. They don't actually necessarily punch in, that sort of thing, but they usually do work for an insurance agency. So, traveling salespeople. Remember, they are out there in their car for the company, driving around from company to company. They have the expenses, they have the, you know, but they're on the clock, um, but usually at a set amount. Okay, so it's almost like they're a salaried employee and they usually, in a sense, get bonuses based upon their sales, that sort of thing. But they are an actual employee of that company. Okay. My grandfather used to do this for um, Rainbow. The vacuum cleaner sales. They used to have the, they, they had the vacuum cleaners that actually had water in them. Um, you put, they look like a little, they look kind of like R2-D2. Okay, they, they were a round dome thing. You put, had water in the bottom, it sucked it through the top, through into the water and particles were stored in the water. Worked great, you know, 
but they actually worked for the company. And back then it wasn't necessarily that uh, um, they were a statutory employee, but that's actually how it was reported. And they were a traveling salesperson. Um, and he did that for a while. I don't know. I don't think I'd want to do that, but that, they're door to door salesmen, the full of rush men. I don't know if all of them were classified that way, but that would be another, that would be something like that. Um, commission. Some commissioned truck drivers. There you go. They're actually getting commission on their sales. So they're not necessarily going, uh, punching in and getting hourly, but they are getting a commissioned um, amount for their loads. Um, they're the only ones who really, the biggest determination is when you are doing it, they're getting a W-2 and it has box 13 checked. That will trigger everything for the uh, statutory employee. And like I said, it goes under the expense report. It doesn't go under the uh, like it's regular income. So there are a lot of benefits to that in that sense, because then you have a lot of things you can end up writing off. So, all right, statutory non-employee. No, trust me, having done this for years, this one is a lot of fun. What does this mean? They don't get a W-2. They get a 1099 miscellaneous. Now, what's the difference between those two? Biggest difference. They pay their own self-employment tax. They get taxed themselves. So they have no withholding out of it. Full amount goes to them. No withholding out of it. It's a 1099 miscellaneous. Um, they're responsible for paying their own taxes. No social security taken out. You know, nothing like that. They get a check. That's it. Um, good parts and bad parts. They get to report all their income on a Schedule C. So lots of deductions. Okay, they got to take a lot against that money for all of their expenses. Now, they do work for a company, but they're usually using the brand and not working for the company. They're just kind of using the brand and you'll understand when you see who they are. Um, they do pay self-employment tax. That's their version of paying social security. Is that good or bad? Self-employment tax is about the same paying it either way. And in some cases it's actually a little bit more. So that's kind of a trade-off, but you do get to have a lot of deductions that a lot of people who just get a W-2 don't think about taking. So that's one of those benefits. And here's the big one, and this is the most important one. Their pay is directly related to sales, not to hours worked. Okay, that is one of the biggest keys to a statutory non-employee. It is related to sales, not to hours worked. So in other words, you cannot go, well, I worked for uh, 10 hours last night and let me put those hours on there. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. What is directly tied to is, I had this sale and this sale and this sale, this is all my commissions. Okay, so, who are these people? Okay, it's pretty easy. There's only two types. Direct salespeople. In other words, they go out and they set up accounts and they then sell the material to them. They're direct salespeople. They go visit places and try to sell the properties, that sell the materials, and they just are based on commission only. Everything else is determined entirely by them and it's usually for a specific product. It's not like the traveling salesman where you really are representing the company and going from place to place and doing that sort of thing. This is, you are um, pretty much like a distributor, if you want to think about it that way. Um, 
in a lot of cases, this is where, you know, the MLMs, the multi-level marketing, uh, Valentis, the, we were talking earlier about the mm -hmm. coffee, Valentis. Yeah. Um, this is where you fall into it, basically. You get a 1099 miscellaneous. Um, you are directly responsible for your commission that you get on it, and you're splitting it with the company. This is the category you fall in. This is a direct salesperson. This is exactly who they are. All the people in those, in a multi-level marketing uh, program, fall into specifically. And one other type of person, trust me, having done both of these, specifically licensed real estate agents. When you're a licensed real estate agent, you are using usually the equipment that is supplied in the office, it's available to you to use if you want when you're in the office. Sometimes you have to rent it or you know, if you want office space, you have to rent it from them. But you are using basically their name. You are franchising if you want to think about it that way. Um, you get to use their name and say, I work for this company. You don't. You really work with them in a sense. You work, you're doing a job for them. Um, you have to supply everything yourself. Then when you get a commission for a sales, because you're using their name, they get a portion of that sales to use their name. And that's what you are paying them for. Uh, their name and actually their broker's license. Uh, so you're under their uh, protection, uh, their errors and emissions insurance and things like that. Are you working only for one company? Now, that's the other thing. When you are a licensed real estate agent, <coughs> it will... It's determined by your broker. Some states, their state laws vary by state. Some state laws say that you can only work for one licensed broker at a time. Mm -hmm. um, others say that each area, in other words, each MLS, each regional multiple listing service, because each one's different, and they govern each area, the real estate association in each area is an independent body and you are joining each one, you can join one in each area because you are an independent. What so do yes, you call the area, regional? Regional multiple listing service. So like here, we have what's called the RMLS for Portland. Then there's the Northwest MLS for Seattle and you're usually a, become a member of both of them, so you can list properties in Seattle and Portland and Vancouver. Um, because they're joined here, the MLS include Corp, because Portland and Vancouver are basically the same city, um, even though they're on different sides of the state, on two different states, they're actually the same one. They list in properties together, but you have to have licenses. They divide them based where your licenses, you're only allowed to list in the Washington side, or only allowed to list in the Oregon side and sell in those areas. But if you have licenses for both, you can do both sides. Okay. And that's just an agreement between the two states that allow you to do that. But you can't do anything in Seattle unless you also join that one. So what they are doing is they're letting you contract with multiple companies. So you can join multiple areas and be under multiple brokers at one time and have your license being held by multiple brokers mm. but not within the same RMLS. <clears throat> so what that means is I can't go here and uh, be with like uh, Realty Pro and uh, Colo Banker at the same time. Okay, not within the same area. Because for one thing, it would be a conflict within the RMLS. <laughs> so for licensed real estate agents, they do have, it, it falls under a special category 
because there are state laws that govern it. It's not, uh, you have your own business. It's going to be like this. Let me, let me do this. It's a little bit different than a normal business because of the situation you have. Let me do this. Here is you. And we're going to show you and how you work. You are a licensed real estate agent. You work within a brokerage. This is a broker and I can't spell. You work for a broker. And this would be something like uh, um, Caldwell Banker, something like that, or uh, Prudential Northwest, whatever it may be. Okay, something like that. Then that would have another, this is done by the RMLS. That's the Regional Multiple Listing Service, okay? That is the area, okay? There are multiple And they're not always called RM RMLSs. Sometimes they're just abbreviated as MLSs. Okay. Within a state. And these are all controlled. So I can do this. So if you want to know how complicated this one gets. Oh, actually, I have forgotten one circle. Let me do this. Hang on a second. <laughs> I've forgotten a circle. Um, oh, actually, no, not necessarily. I, I This then has... Uh, let me do it that, this way because it doesn't include all of them. Let me try to just include some of this. Okay, as you can see, I'm not. I'm trying not to include this one down here. Okay, so really, this does include this guy. Okay, this one is the Realtor Association which governs your actions within that association. And then finally, you have this one. Yeah, if you wanted to get complicated, which is the state. Okay. Anybody like that picture? Let me try to explain it. <laughs> this is how real estate actually works. When you are, and there actually is one additional one here I'm not gonna get into, is because each county also has its own rules too. So here's you. You work for a broker, all right? That broker is where you get your name you're using, and this is the person who's going to give you the 1099 miscellaneous. To get that 10 miscel 1099 miscellaneous, you go to the state and get your license. You then have to join the RMLS, okay? In our case, and I'm going to pull this guy over here if I can get him. Look at that, I was able to. Ours, here includes Oregon and Washington, okay? In our 
RMLS. Okay. Actually, this shouldn't be this one. I guess this should be this one. It includes Oregon and Washington across two states. But this would be Seattle, and it has its own. To govern over these two, they have an association to make sure that they comply because lots of people, lots of people join both of them. They have an association between the two with a set of rules to govern these two. And you have to join and agree to their rules for both of them. In addition, then, there's the state overseas and the state real estate board overseas, just like our tax board, oversees them. And by the way, our tax board, if you don't know, does work a lot like this. Because we have our, you being an LTP, if you're an LTP, then you oversee the LTCs in the office. That LTC is overseen by our lead uh, consultant, who is actually uh, Dick Farnsworth at our Stark Street office. He oversees all of ours, who are overseen by the Oregon Tax Preparers Board and the rules that they have to live by, that, that they've specified that we need to follow, which are overseen by the state of Oregon, the actual, uh, the uh, Senate, the Oregon Senate and their rule, their laws. So that's actually even how the tax board works. Those are statutory employees. The reason this is that I'm saying this is because as you can tell, they don't, we don't technically work in a sense as a regular employee. Okay. Now, because we are supplying you with all the stuff, that's the one exception for us. You're not doing sales. Okay, we do have you on hourly, but the governing, actually, that's how you make the determination what you are. Yours is not related to sales, so you do not fall into the category of a statutory non-employees, but real estate agents do. Same structure, same rules that you have to follow in that sense, but not... Uh, Aren't we selling our services? In a sense, but it's not, here, here's the main, here's honest to God, the only reason that we are similar to the real estate agents is we are the only state in the country that does this. Oh. There is no other state that does this. Um, which is why we're having this class and everything else, because there are, are no other states that actually do this. Washington, you don't even need a license. Um, if you pass the basic class, which we just have a, a, a the class, the basic exam given by us, you are now qualified to do taxes in the state. Um, you just apply for your P10 and you can, by Washington law, can do taxes within the state of Washington. Uh, California has a licensing requirement, but it is a, only a tier one licensing requirement. In other words, Everyone getting a license, as soon as you've passed the first test, are now able to open a real estate, uh, open a, uh, a tax firm, and can prepare and have taxes done there for anyone. Pretty scary. <clears throat> um, Oregon is the only state <clears throat> in the entire country that sets this up where we have a tax board, where we have tax preparer ones who are only allowed for the first year to perform, perform taxes under the supervision of an LTC for the first 200 and I think it's 244 hours now, or I got to double check 244 hours or the first ca first calendar year. So even if you get it done within the first year, you still can't complete the year and start doing taxes on your own. So if you get the hours done, you still got to still be under the supervision of the LTC. Mm -hmm. um, then the second year you can do taxes on your own until you build up the 1100 hours, then you can actually go 
and uh, take the second exam and become an LTC, and then you can actually start doing them on your own. Usually that takes two years to do it. The exception is, is the state of Oregon cannot supersede the federal government EA certification, which is way above the Oregon one, which is saying that if you have an EA that surpasses the 100 hour, the 1100 hour requirement. And if you have an EA, they do require you sit for the um, Oregon portion of the LTC exam and that's it. And then you can become an LTC in Oregon. But you do still have to, we have to still have for the company, we do have to have the structure of all of our new ones are overseen by the LTCs. There has to be an LTC 50% of the hours in every store um, for every uh, hour that we're open to do taxes. The entire district has to be overseen by a, 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 a uh, um, designated LTC which then has to be reported in all the licenses, including the store licenses, because each store has to be individually licensed and each agent, each tax preparer has to be individually licensed, um, has to be reported to the Oregon Tax Board, who oversees all of their functions, who then has to be overseen by the, uh, Oregon, the, the Oregon's actual Congress, does it? And we are it. We are the only state that requires it, requires it. So as you can see, it's really complicated just for us. No other state does it. Mm -hmm. Which is really fun when I had half of my people in Southwest Washington and half of my people in Oregon. It was kind of fun because my Oregon people could come over and help in Washington. And I had a couple of people who were licensed in Washington who were licensed for Oregon, who lived in Washington, so I could send them over to Oregon. But man, talk about scheduling issues. You know, it's kind of like trying to jump between the two states was interesting. So none of the states, none of the other states, there's not a state, there are 49 other states that do not do this. <laughs> Oregon is the only one that has this structure. And the thing is they took their, they also, by the way, just in case you were wondering, this is also one of the toughest structures that they have for their realtors. It's not this tough in most states to be a realtor either, but this is how they set it up for Oregon too. <clears throat> Having done that too, so. But it's really, this is the only occupation licensed real estate agents because you are governed by outside bodies that have nothing to do with your employer. You know, if you go to McDonald's, who do you answer to? If I work at McDonald's, who do I, who, who do I answer to for my job? McDonald's. McDonald's. Thank you. Okay. That's who I answer to is McDonald's. Um, but what is the most important thing, especially about realtors? <coughs> and this is the important thing is what do realtors sell that's important to the state? They sell the dirt. Uh -huh. They're selling pieces of the state. They're selling that property tax. They buy and sell that property tax, so the state wants to regulate it. Mm -hmm. So because they are doing something that affects what they control, they want to make sure they have their say over it. And if you want to think about it that way, so realtors and direct salespeople, that's it. If you have those two things on the test, if it asks you, um, Direct salespeople or licensed real estate agents are what type of employee? Non-story, non-employee. And that's the only ones. Those are the, and as a matter of fact, direct salespeople, really, it's the realtors. That's the biggest one. And let's go back about one thing. How do they get paid? 
commission, 1099. They are a business themselves. This is the strangest way to be employed, but you are really your own business. You're using somebody's name, some realtor is the broker's name, but outside of that name, pretty much, you're on your own. They may help you occasionally with a few things, but overall, you're, you're using that name, but nothing else. Okay. And if we go back here, let's, let's, so let's, let's review just a little bit here. All right. For an employee, employees, what are you? W-2. W-2. You work for the employer. You have a regular uh, paycheck. He sets your hours. Now, what are the three tests? Behavioral control, financial control, type of relationship. Three for three. You go, Naomi. That was awesome. Three for three. And what do they mean exactly? Behavior control? They determine your hours. How I'm going to do your job, how I'm going to work, when I'm going to work, I tell you how you're going to do it. Financial control. They tell you how much you're going to make. They buy your, their stuff for you. You don't buy your tools. You don't buy anything. They, you walk in, they pay for everything and hand it to you. Okay. You don't have to buy anything. You're not coming with anything. They are basically giving it all to you to start. Okay, financially, you can walk in with just the clothes on your back and they will give you the rest. Okay, you're providing labor and intellectual labor, or physical labor, whatever it may be. <coughs> Type of relationship. For employee, you have benefits. There you go. If you're expecting benefits, vacation pay uh, for an independent contractor. Mm, no benefits. <laughs> no benefits, and <laughs> normally it's a written contract for a specific amount of time. Oh, there goes the nose. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. And what is the difference on how does an, a, an independent con contractor get paid? Ten ninety nine miscellaneous. You got it. And finally. The statutory employee, okay, how does he get paid? Because he's a special one. W-2. Yes, thank you. He actually works for the company. All right. So how do you know he's a statutory employee on that W-2? Box, Box 13 check. Way to go, Sheila. That was awesome. And Naomi, that was perfect. Um, so what don't they pay? Self-employment tax. Yes, exactly. And, but what do they get to do? Schedule income on schedule. Uh, both of you nailed that, man. You guys are just kicking it. All right. So they get to do a Schedule C. And you guys got all of the determinations. All right, now, what is the major difference between an income statement and a balance sheet? Mm. Income statement uh, for a specific period, balance sheet for a specific date ongoing. There you go. And what about the final result? If I look at them, if I wanted to, if I didn't, if I, if I didn't know what each report was, what could I look at and determine, is that an income statement or is, is that a balance sheet? Oh, a balance sheet is assets and liabilities and the result equals zero. Thank you, that's what I was looking for. And the income statement? Is, is income and expenses. 
and the result hopefully would not be zero. <laughs> it would not be zero or negative. <laughs> it would show hopefully positive. Exactly. The one shows hopefully a positive and the other one will always show zero. If it doesn't, there's a problem. <laughs> All right. That is awesome, guys. All right. It is 12 o'clock. And unfortunately, I am losing my voice. So we are going to cut it a little bit short today. Um, mainly because I don't think I'll be able to talk much longer. Um, I'm going to leave the room open if you guys would like to discuss anything. Naomi, you are all set for tomorrow. Um, yeah. I want you to relax tonight. Okay. All right, and not do too much extreme, but I am going to cut us short today only because, like I said, I am, my voice is starting to die. I've been eating halls all morning so I could try to keep talking, but it's going to go here. Um, and then we'll be again together on Wednesday. All right, I will be online all day tomorrow. Um, so log, uh, Naomi, naturally, I want you to call me and tell me that you passed. <laughs> I'm not expecting to hear that you didn't. So, you know, Hey, okay. all right. So, yeah. all right. Can so, she last day? I have a question to her. Yeah. Like I said, I'm going to leave the room open. You guys talk as long as you want. I just, <laughs> like I said, I just, I can't talk anymore. I can tell that I'm starting to cough. So, all right. So we'll cut it there to, uh, for today. You guys go ahead and talk as long as you want. I'll, I'll leave the room open for you guys. Okay. okay? All right. I hope you right. feel better, Ryan. Oh, thanks, Gary. It's just like I said, I just, I'm losing the voice. I can hear it starting to crackle. <laughs> so, all right. Yep. All right. I'll talk to you guys Hi, then Sheila. either tomorrow or on Wednesday. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Bye. Hi there. Hi, I just want to know the difference between joint venture and partnership. Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> okay, it's okay. Because joint venture, you're a couple, right? You're what? A couple. Yeah. A joint venture, qualified joint venture is your yeah, married. Quite yeah. Well, yeah. Married couple, a partnership, and you can, but you can file as a, a two file a joint return with two Schedule C's, and uh, you're not actually set up as a partnership, but it's it's looked at that way. Is it the pass through? I believe so. Yes, with the, with a qualified joint venture, but you have to be married, and you have to file a joint return, and you have to both be actively involved in the business. Um, and yeah. split your, your profits or whatever amongst you the way you've got your business set up before the two of you. Uh, yeah, okay. the, uh, and so it passes through the same way as that, but you're not required to file and get an EIN necessarily. You can still use your, uh, your, just your regular social security number, mm -hmm. but you cannot do it and file married filing separately. Um, you cannot do it and file uh, head of household or something like that. It's got to be married filing joint. I, uh, wow, Garrett, I am so impressed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I read up on all that. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. I, Sheila, I find on fa Facebook different uh, free webinar on bookkeeping. Is that okay? to try because uh, I like to study bookkeeping and I find several who offers uh, free training yeah QuickBooks has webinars too um, no, uh, I'm more interested on in the actual bookkeeping yes I find wait I'm looking what's the name I find several, uh, you know, Clackamas County Community College has an online course. Is it free? 
No, it's not free. But yeah, they do it the, the same for... way. They do it the same way as as this class is done. So you're online with other people. Uh, yeah, this one I I find it bookkeeping life free webinar. Discover the secret formula to getting bookkeeping clients. Oh, getting bookkeeping clients. That's a di whole different ball game right there. I thought uh, you were talking about uh, yeah. classes. Yeah, I wait. I find another one. Mm -hmm. Well, I talked to a marketing person, and this is what she told me. She yeah. said the best way to, to market bookkeeping is to um, have, um, number one, you have to have a, uh, um, a web page, and then you can do a Facebook ad that links to the web page. And she said that's really the most effective way to do it. Mm, but uh, how about wait, bookkeeping business from home? But what I like is to study first. Yeah. Yeah. This. Yeah. I uh, mean, if if you don't have any real practical experience, you could get yourself in a, a lot of trouble quickly. Because I mean, the water gets deep really really fast. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So, what is your suggestion again? Um, well, if if you were marketing yourself as a bookkeeper, uh, the, the best. Not yet. I'm not marketing myself as bookkeeper. I want to learn because I know bookkeeping in the Philippines, but I do not know here in. We do bookkeeping in Excel and. Now here in QuickBook, right? You said only QuickBook. You do bookkeeping using... Yeah, I don't do it in Excel, no. Yeah, that's what I like to learn. When I enrolled uh, QuickBook, I think that's not enough. <laughs> the application, I have not applied what I'm learned. I like to... Uh, learn more about bookkeeping that is different right um it's their study it would be different than doing it in excel for sure um I, I think i know how you're doing it i mean you're 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 doing a spreadsheet with you yeah. know your um uh, your income and your expenses right yeah but now yeah. what i need to know is uh bookkeeping in QuickBook, right? Yeah, that because that's the most one that's that's one that's most used by people yeah. in America. Yeah, where where will I learn that? Well you can go to intuit.com and um, it there's a little link there to become a QuickBooks Pro Advisor and it's free. And uh, there's a QuickBooks course that's online, online course for QuickBooks Online. Now, that's different than QuickBooks Desktop, but the online course is free. You take that online course and you pass through tests. It's a, a series of, I think, 13 different modules. And when you, when you pass the test, then you're, you're what's called a QuickBooks Pro Advisor. And uh, you can be referred to people that are looking for somebody to do their bookkeeping um, right straight from Intuit. What, where do I go for online course? What web website? Intuit.com. I-N-T-U-I-T? -I Correct. I will start with www. That. Hold on, let me see if I can get you there. Uh, no, I don't have that link up anymore. Ah, um, okay, I will yeah, try www.intuit.com. Yeah. And um, you'll, you'll see... Um, let me go there for you, just one second. 
Yeah, because I do not want to pay anymore. I don't have means now. I am only part-time. I'm only working part-time. Yeah, I hear you. That's why I'm looking for free. <laughs> yeah, it's free. And it, it takes. it's going to take you a while to do. It took me like a month to get through it. Well, it's okay while I'm doing this uh, our class. Can I <laughs> do that also while I'm not yet working? Oh, sure. Hold on. Okay. Let's see if I can get you there. So it's, um, here's the address up here. And then it'll take you to, um, take your pro, pro advisor membership to new levels, blah, blah, blah. And like I said, it's free, and it's going to take you a while to do, but um, it's it's worth it. Wait, I will uh, save it. Okay. But the 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 online component is totally free. And um, it's probably worthwhile to do. Uh, the desktop version is, it, it looks way, way different. It works the same, but it looks way different. Um, it depends on who you're working with, whether they're working with online or they're working with desktop. You'll find that most uh, CPAs want to work with desktop, but Intuit is really, really pushing online. So you'll find that that you're going to be referred to people with online. And a lot of times you don't even need to go anywhere. You can just yeah. do their, their books online. Yeah, I don't have car and I don't drive. <laughs> well, then that's good for you then. They can, you can do it from your house. Yeah. You know, uh, oh, this and one. The other I... nice thing, in, Noemi, is that if you have any problems or questions, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll up to five people can be logged in at the same time. Okay. Can log, I can log in too, and I can help you out. Okay, thank you. Oh, I found this also, www.melaniepower.com. It says, hi, it's Mel Power here, and I have just spent the last week putting together a free training for you on how you can start your own highly profitable bookkeeping business and grow it quickly but my daughter told me oh do not <laughs> yeah uh, a lot of those things will ask you for money okay yeah and I... that's not that's not the best thing for you right now okay um, the one, okay i will try the one you gave <laughs> yeah yeah oh thank you very much Sheila. you're very welcome Okay, I don't want to take more of your time. Just rest. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. And if you have any problems or questions, just give me a call. Do you have my oh. number? Yeah, I got it. Okay, yeah, I got it already. Thank you. You're very welcome. Bye. Bye-bye.